chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. This is kind of going to be an old-time Pentecostal message today. I'm simply talking today about the Holy Ghost and fire. Luke chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. We stand in honor of the reading of God's Word, and this church always preaches from the King James text. Not because we believe it's the only text or anything like that, but uh, we, that is what we use. And as the people were in expectation, and all men used in their hearts, of John, whether he were the Christ or not, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. If you bow your heads with me a moment, Father, we love you, God, today. We thank you, Lord, for the house of God. We thank you, Lord, for the word of the Lord today. Master, in the name of Jesus, we ask, God, that you would loose your anointing upon your messenger at this hour. Allow me, Master, to deliver the word of the Lord that you've given me for this moment in time, that the people of God will be able to receive it, absorb it, incorporate it into their understanding. Let it today build faith. Let it today build character. Let it today establish integrity. Oh, Master, let it draw us closer to your holiness. Master, in the name of Jesus, touch the ear of every hearer, those in this room, those who listen and watch by reason of the Internet. Let the Word of God today accomplish that for which it is sent. For we ask it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated this afternoon. I did this on purpose because I wanted it on video. Uh, because we need as many prayer warriors involved in this as possible. Sister Lisa uh, gave me permission to share this. I, I'm not doing this without her permission. Just I want Martin to know that because he wasn't there when she did this. But she gave me full permission to include any and all details and what have you, okay? Uh, Sister Lisa Berry was diagnosed, she told me the other day, uh, Thursday, uh, Friday, I'm sorry, with cervical cancer. So she needs our prayers. Definitely. Uh, I walked in to see her Friday and I've been trying to go at least every third day, you know, somewhere around. I wanted to go every other day, but my schedule's just been crazy. Uh, I'm an old-fashioned pastor, folks. I'm going to tell you, I'm an old-fashioned pastor. Nowadays, pastors I had as a kid, they'd make one token visit to the hospital, pray over you, and then that's the only time you saw them. Uh, I love Brother Gillum, and you know he's my, my model in ministry, and Brother Gillum was a whole lot better a pastor than that. And I would rather be like Brother Gillum than the pastors I had as a kid. And when I have a member in a nursing home or in a rehab facility or in a hospital, um, I understand, especially Lisa, she has no family locally. So if you can get out there and visit her, please take a few minutes and go visit her. Uh, she has no local family. All she really has locally is Martin, basically, and, and our church. And so I try to go see her as often as I can, and I try to spend at least an hour to an hour and a half with her. That's my goal when I go. Uh, because, you know, when you're sitting in a hospital or a rehab facility day in and day out by yourself, you know, you have no company, you have no fellowship. Uh, it's nice to have church members. It's nice to have your pastor come in and see you. 
I went to see her on Friday, and I, I walked in her room. I said, well, hello there, sweetie, you know. And she just burst out weeping, and she said, I'm so glad to see you. I'm so glad you're here. And I give her a hug, and I said, well, what's wrong, honey, you know? And she told me, and, you know, she's, 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 we talked later, and she said, I'm ready to go. I know where I'm going. She said, that's not the problem. And I said, sweetie, listen, if you don't have some sort of a reaction sometimes to this kind of news, there's something wrong with you. You know, news like this shocks and, and you know, anybody, any, I don't care who you are. I don't care how spiritual you are. And I said, what well, ultimately it's about being able to respond to it with faith and trusting God. You know, that's our goal. That's what we're trying to do. And she said, well, I'm ready. She said, I'm not worried about where I'm going or anything. And anyway, uh, but we want to believe God for a miracle. We want, we'd want, we like to see the Lord touch her. Lisa is 80 years old. Uh, she's not a young spring chicken anymore. Uh, she is having issues with her memory and, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, so we want God's will to be done. But if our will has anything to do with it, we'd like to keep her around a while. Because we love Lisa. We appreciate her so much. Uh, she does contribute to this church in a very tangible way. And by that, I do not mean finances. I'm talking about praying. I'm talking about uh, in worship she participates, you know. And that is important, folks. I'm going to tell you, if people come in and they don't give a nickel, but they really participate in worship and they really participate in the spiritual aspects of the church, I am grateful. It really makes me happy. And Lisa's been with us now, good grief, I don't even know how long, a pretty good while. And uh, we are so grateful for her. So Amen. keep Lisa in prayer. If you're watching online, uh, please make Sister Lisa Berry an issue of prayer. Uh, keep her in your prayer on your prayer list, you know, keep her in mind, and let's believe God together for a miracle. Okay, that's all I wanted to say, but I wanted our online friends to be able to see that as well. And since we only share our messages on uh, YouTube and all that, I had to put it in that portion of the service. Amen. A lot of people think this Pentecostal message of the Holy Ghost baptism is some sort of a newfangled 20th century invention because it was at the turn of the century as the 19th century transitioned into the 20th century, literally on New Year's Day, literally at the very turn of the, eight, the 19th to the 20th century, God began to pour the Holy Ghost out on groups of people all over the world. At that time, communication and transportation were not like they are today. So while people in Wales were receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost and speaking with other tongues, as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance and experiencing a burst of joy and love in their hearts, uh, that they couldn't explain that was motivating them to dance and get happy and, and to act like they were bombed out of their minds. There were people in Tennessee this was happening too. While there were people in Tennessee this was happening too, there were people in California this was happening too. While there were people in California this was happening too, there were people in Missouri this was happening too. And it was literally happening around the world simultaneously as the one century turned into the next. This is what we call the Pentecostal revivals. This is what we believe to be the latter rain. Amen. The Bible said there is a former rain and a latter rain. You have rains at the beginning of the rainy season. You got rains at the end of the rainy season. What happens at the end of the rainy season? Harvest. Harvest. Well, we believe this was the beginning of the latter rain. In other words, the last day revival leading up to the coming of the Lord. Well, the Pentecostal movement since that day has been the fastest growing movement in human and church history. Since that day, it has been the fastest growing movement. The Pentecostal movement has gone into countries around the world that at one time were dominated by the Roman Catholic Church 
and it has emaciated their hold on those countries. Literally, the Pentecostal movement has literally absorbed tens of thousands and even millions of people around the world who are, who are uh, citizens of countries that were once dominated by Roman Catholicism. And now the Pentecostal movement is one of the strongest movements in those countries. It lived up to its reputation. It lived up to, because after the rain came the harvest. You hear what I'm telling you now? Amen. Now, a lot of people think, Brother Johnny, that we Pentecostal folk, we just invented this whole thing, and you know, it, it's all an imagination, and we're trying to take Scripture and make it say something. Well, I've got news for you. The Holy Ghost baptism is something that was promised and preached long before Jesus came. In the Old Testament, we saw promises of God filling His people. In Joel, the Lord said, and in the last days I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy upon your servants and upon your handmaidens will I pour out of my spirit in those days. Never in human history has God ever poured his spirit out upon any people. And yet God said in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all all flesh. He said your sons and daughters are going to prophesy. He said that uh, he would pour out upon your servants and upon your handmaidings. In other words, there would be no distinction in class. God wasn't going to pour out the Holy Ghost on the wealthy and forget about the poor. Uh -uh. He said, no sir, I'm going to pour it out on all people. Your sons, your daughters, your uh, servants, your handmaidens, and God has done that. And Jesus promised the gift of the Holy Ghost. Jesus promised his disciples that the Holy Ghost would be given. His, some of his last words to the apostles and disciples were, Go into the city of Jerusalem and wait until the promise of the Father come upon you. He said, don't go anywhere, don't preach anything, I'm ascending, but don't you go anywhere from Jerusalem until the Holy Ghost comes. Then we read in the book of Acts, the second chapter, how that the Holy Ghost did in fact arrive. Verse 1 through 4, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. That was the initial first outpouring of the Holy Ghost upon the fledgling church of Jesus Christ. Further in the book of Acts, we read over and over again, we read how that Paul came upon a group of believers and... Uh, he asked them, he said, have you received, listen, have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? The Baptists will try to tell you, you receive the Holy Ghost when you believe. No, you do not. No, you do not. Paul said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? So the Holy Ghost comes after we have believed on the gospel, after we have given or put our faith in the gospel. It doesn't come at that time. The Bible said God gives unto every man a measure of faith. It does not say he gives you the Holy Ghost. And they said we hadn't even heard there was any such thing as the Holy What are you talking about, the Holy Ghost? So Paul had to explain to them, well, now Jesus has ascended, but by his Spirit he has returned. And when he returns... He returns in spirit form and he fills us with himself. He fills us 
with the very power and the very essence that he walked planet earth with. And the word of God said that when Paul told them this, that he laid hands on them and they began to speak with other tongues as they received the gift of the Holy Ghost. We read other accounts. Peter goes in to preach to a bunch of folks who are Gentiles. They are Romans. They're Italians. And he goes in to preach to the house of Cornelius and tell them about the gospel. They hadn't heard anything about the gospel. He's sharing the gospel with them. And the word of God said, And while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them that heard him. And they began to speak with other tongues. They began to manifest this filling of the Holy Ghost by speaking another language, okay? As the Spirit of God flipped the switch in their spirit, allowing them to do so. It's not a magical, mystical thing. It's nothing to be fearful of. It's not a devil. It's none of that. God simply puts the ability, our spirit begins to pray. It's not just your head praying, not just your mind praying, but your spirit begins to pray. Now, your spirit's part of you, so it's not, it, it's not disconnected from you. You know, it's not like you lose control and you all of a sudden have no control. But your spirit, you'll feel yourself being motivated. Your spirit begins to pray, and as it prays, it will not do so in the same language that you speak normally. Okay? That's all it is. The spirit... That way we know we receive the Holy Ghost. When I hear myself speaking another tongue, another language that I've never learned, aha, there I go, I've got the Holy Ghost. I know it is what the Pentecostal movement for uh, a century now has referred to as, it is the initial evidence of receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. To be honest, you don't have to, you may never speak in tongues another day in your life. But you've got the Holy Ghost. The evidence was there. You have the Holy Ghost. But there is the gift of tongues. In other words, people continue to use the gift of the Holy Ghost. They do continue in prayer and in worship to use, you know, to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives them the utterance. But that, that's a whole other teaching. That's a whole other story. We'll go into that at another time. That's learning to yield and submit to the Holy Ghost and allowing God to work through us. The Word of God today tells us that our God is a consuming fire. Well, consuming means that it destroys. <laughs> consuming means that it has the ability to annihilate. If you've ever looked at a house that's burned to the ground, then you realize fire can be awful destructive. When it says it consumes, I mean it consumes down to the bones, it consumes beyond the bones, depending on how long it's allowed to burn. I mean, uh, what once stood as a mighty mansion can all of a sudden be a pile of dust on the ground, a bunch of black ashes, because fire can consume, amen? It can destroy, it can annihilate. The Word of God tells us that our God is a consuming fire. And yet, with the promise of the Holy Ghost, John said in our primary text today, with the promise of the gift of the Holy Ghost came also the promise of a baptism by fire. Wow. Now, Lord, isn't that going to hurt? <laughs> Lord, isn't that going to be painful? Isn't that going to be destructive? If God baptizes me by fire, remember what happened to the altar? Remember what happened to the sacrifice when uh, Elijah stood on Mark, Mount Carmel uh, with the prophets of Baal? You remember what happened? And he prayed down fire from heaven, and God sent fire from heaven. And the Word of God said that it not only consumed the sacrifice and consumed the wood, but it consumed the stone that the altar was made out of and it consumed the water they had poured upon the sacrifice. All the elements that shouldn't have burned, it burned. The water shouldn't have been consumed. The stones most certainly should not have been consumed. Now the wood we can understand, the sacrifice we can understand, but how in the world do you burn up stones? That has to be an awful powerful fire. Amen. 
how is God going to baptize his people with the Holy Ghost and with fire? Well, first of all, you have to understand the nature of the Holy Ghost. You have to understand what the Holy Ghost baptism is. The Holy Ghost baptism is God putting himself, his spirit, in us. Now, that shouldn't be a fearful thing for us. Why? Because we know what God looks like. We know who God is. He's revealed himself to us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who'd be afraid to have Jesus in them? Hello? Amen? Who'd be afraid to have Jesus in them? Now, it'd be different if we didn't know what God looked like. It'd be different if we didn't know how God acted. It'd be different if we didn't understand God's nature. But God didn't send the Holy Ghost first and then reveal himself in Jesus later. No, he revealed himself in Jesus first. And then the Lord said to his disciples, he was talking about the eventual coming of the Holy Ghost. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. And he continues and he says, I will come unto you. So the Holy Ghost is nothing more, nothing less than the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Well, we should welcome the Spirit of Jesus Christ in our lives. Amen. But with the arrival of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the invisible presence of Christ, also comes fire. Woo! All right, Lord, now you're scaring me a little bit. I don't want to be baptized by fire. I saw what you did to that sacrifice at Mount Carmel. Yeah, but did you see what I did in the wilderness with the people of Israel? When they were passing through the wilderness, did you see how I used fire with them? Well, let me see, Lord. Yeah, by night you guided them with a pillar of fire. By night they followed your leading. They followed you because you led them with a pillar of flame by night. That's right. I'm putting the fire in your life to lead you. I'm putting the fire in your life so that in dark hours you have direction and you have guidance. The Comforter, the Spirit of God, is in your life to guide you and to be there to direct you. When you cannot see, you can see what direction to go in because there's a pillar of fire. And what does that pillar of fire produce? What does it create? What does it provide for us? It also provides for us what? Light. You light a fire, you've got light. You go out camping and you light a campfire, Johnny and Bill, you're going to be able to see anything comes around you. If a bear comes out of the woods, you're going to see that bear. Hello now. If a deer comes out of the trees, you're going to see that deer. Why? Because fire produces light. So the Holy Ghost comes not only... Does the Holy Ghost come, but it comes with fire. We have direction. We have leadership. We have light. We have illumination. The Word of God promises that the Spirit of God will illuminate for us. The Spirit of God will allow us to see. Do you follow what I'm telling you? That's why the Holy Ghost comes. That's why the Holy Ghost comes with fire. Hallelujah. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He also said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. He also said to the church, you are the light of the world. What? Wait a minute, Lord, I thought you were the light of the world. I am. You're the light of the world, Lord. How can, how can you be the light of the world and I be the light of the world at the same time? Well, it's easy if you take his light and put it in you. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Hello now. I can take campfire, Martin, and I can pull a stick out of that campfire, and I can light a thousand candles. And guess where that light all came from? The campfire. Right. Every one of those candles came out of that campfire. Am I telling the truth now? Right. Well, you see, if the Spirit of Christ enters us, then so does the light. Hallelujah! Right. So does the flame. Do you follow what I'm saying? So again, when it said you should be baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire, and when Jesus told his disciples before he ascended, he said you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Not many days hence. Not too far down the road. Just a little while. 
So when that fire comes, it brings illumination. It brings Christ into our life. So now the light that he was, we become. Because he is shining through us and in us. Hallelujah. Isn't that exciting? It's not really. So the idea of fire isn't quite as scary as you might have thought it was, is it? I was thinking this week as I'm driving up to Oklahoma, boy, I'm telling you, I love, I love driving distances, and I like when Tommy's not there <laughs> because everything goes smooth. When he's there, I wind up stuck on rocks and logs. I wind up in a riverbed somewhere, you know. I have to pay $300 to get towed out. But when he's not there, everything just goes beautiful. I'm afraid to take him up there for fear that the woods are going to burn down or something. I don't know. But I'm going to tell you, I, I love driving and I love traveling because when I'm in my car and I'm alone, uh, I don't even have to listen to music. I don't need music, folks. I know people, <clears throat> I, I won't call names, I'll just look at them and whistle. <laughs> Man, they can't be in their car three seconds without some racket going on, some kind of music, <laughs> some kind of sound. I'm going to tell you, I like quiet. I like quiet. Gives me an opportunity to fellowship with the Lord. It gives me an opportunity to pray. And when I drive, I have prayer meetings. I'm telling you, I mean literally, I'm not kidding. Every minute I'm in that car, I'm praying. My grandfather used to do this. And bless his heart, you know, he had a, his walk with God was rocky. It was kind of difficult for him. He had a lot of issues and what have you. But boy, I'm going to tell you, when my grandfather would take a trip by himself, he would come home. And you could just see the Spirit of the Lord illuminating from him because he had been in prayer and he'd been worshiping. And he loved that when he drove. And I inherited that from him. So going to Oklahoma three hours up and three hours back, I'm telling you, I had me some of the best prayer meeting you're ever going to have in your life. I had the time. And as I'm driving, I'm thinking about my message this week. And I said, Lord... The only thing I want to understand, the only thing I, I really, really would like to better understand is why it is that you used fire as an illustration for the arrival of the Holy Ghost. And, you know, as a, uh, I understand the concept of light. I understand the concept of leadership. I understand the concept of illumination. I understand the concept of you being the light and sharing your light, you being the flame and sharing your flame with us. I understand all that. I said, but Lord, really in the end, why fire? Because after all, the word of God says our God is a consuming fire. So while fire has all these constructive elements and all these constructive purposes and uses, that's not how you're described. You're described as a consuming fire. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me. He just clear his bell. He said, you remember how Moses and I met? Yeah. Up atop the mountain. And there was a bush that burned, but it was not consumed. Well, how is that? I'm getting chills again. I'm getting goosebumps all over me because I know what's coming. I said, yeah, Lord, you know, that, that always amazed me that because fire by nature is consuming. Fire by nature is destructive and, and destroys anything it touches. But that bush burned, and yet... It, did, it was not consumed. It, there was a fire in the bush, but it was not consumed. How is that? And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, Fire is the perfect symbol of grace. If our God is a consuming fire then by nature, the arrival of God in our lives should destroy us. His holiness and His perfection, the Word of God said, 
that we cannot even stand in the presence of God. If we tried as human beings in human form, we would fall dead. That's what God told Moses. He said, you can't even stand in my presence. You would die. Well, if we cannot stand in your presence, how can you bring your presence into our lives and it not destroy us? Because after all, our God is a consuming and God said, simple, because I choose for it not to. Now think for a minute. The bush that Moses met God at was burning, but it was not consumed. Why? Because God chose for it to work that way. God chose to allow a flame to exist, but not to burn. God says, my presence in your lives is an illustration and a demonstration of my grace. I am in your life, and while I should... Tommy, can you say <laughs> You're in Martin's way. Okay. <laughs> while my presence in your, my, in your life should literally destroy you, it doesn't. Why? Because of grace. Hallelujah. Because of grace. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Let me tell you something. When we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, it is a demonstration of God's grace. We shouldn't even be able to handle the Holy Ghost in our life. We shouldn't even be able to handle the presence of God in our life. The presence of God in our lives, in our mere human body, should be more than we could ever contain. You wonder why those of you especially didn't come up or haven't had a lot of experience with the Pentecostal movement. Now, I know there's a lot of preachers on television that have made a dog and pony show out of it. And trust me, I know they have. But I grew up at a time when it was not being made a dog and pony show out of. You wonder why people will be in prayer, people will be worshiping, and all of a sudden you just see their body give out and they fall to the floor. See the old time school I come from, Martin. I've seen people, I've seen people come up in the in the, the pulpit to sing a special, and they'll be singing a special, and the spirit of the Lord will start moving, and then all of a sudden you just see them drop right to the ground while they're singing. They just drop to the ground, and you wonder what is that? Why do people fall backwards? Why do people fall like that? It's because at that moment, God reveals Himself to them in such a powerful way that they cannot stand. They cannot keep their legs underneath them. And it literally, and I've had it happen. I've experienced it. It's incredible. It, it is amazing. Honey, if God does it, trust me, there ain't a thing in the universe you can do about it. It might have died, Boogie. The battery may have died. I don't know. But there is not a thing in the world you can do about it. You'll just feel your body just give out. It, it, your body just says, okay, this is too much for me. I can't do this. If you look in the Word of God, if you look at the prophet Ezekiel, the Word of God said he stood before the Lord. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon his throne. He was high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And the Word of God said that Ezekiel fell before him as dead. It's the same thing. It's the same experience. It's the same uh, exact thing that is happening. God, the Spirit of God at that moment is too much that for our body to even handle. I remember my little sainted, godly, wonderful great-grandmother, little Portuguese lady about this high and about that around. And I remember watching her in church one Sunday when I was a kid, and she was standing in the pulpit, and she was just worshiping the Lord. All of a sudden, I saw her body go backward. Nobody caught her. Nobody was near her. Nobody was around her. But I literally watched her feet come up off the floor, and she went like this, like a feather, like a feather. And her head fell underneath. The, we had a... a a uh, pew, you know, at the front of the church, of course, and her head went under because if she'd have fallen straight back, she'd have busted her head on the pew. So you know what? God, God just picked her up and put her like that, and her head was under the pew. Don't tell me 
Let me tell you, if God's in it, He's going to take care of you. If God's in it, you don't need anybody to catch you. If God's in it, now if you're up there playing the fool with Benny Hinn, and you're doing it because you think that's what you're supposed to do, watch out, honey, you may crack your noggin. If somebody ain't there to catch you, you're in trouble. If it's God, let me tell you something. If it's God, you don't have to worry about a thing. If it ain't God, you may have to worry a little. You might want, uh, talk on it. You may wind up with a backache or you may wind up with a pain, okay? So the best thing to do is don't put it on. Don't worry. It don't have to happen. It is not necessary. You do not have to fall to be healed. You do not have to fall to receive the Holy Ghost. You do not have to fall when the preacher lays hands on you. But if it's God, there ain't nothing you're going to be able to do about it. No way, trust me. They, I, I've had it happen. I went up for prayer one time. I was under a spirit of depression. And I mean, Martin, I was battling a spirit of depression. That booger was on me like you wouldn't believe. I went to church, and I was under such a depression. This is years before I come out, and, you know, I was struggling with issues. And I went to church, and I was under such a burden of depression. And Sister Bruce, who was like an adopted mom to me, she came over to me and she said, you need to go down for prayer. Well, I didn't want to do nothing. I didn't want to move. I didn't want to go nowhere for nothing. Man, she grabbed me by the hand. Let me tell you something. When Sister Bruce said, you want to go down for prayer, you want to go down for prayer. <laughs> and ain't nothing you're going to do about it. Because she was a mighty woman. And she grabbed hold of my hand and yanked me. And I stood up on my feet. And I'm walking down the front aisle like the middle aisle with her. And the evangelist that night was Brother uh, uh, Gillum's grandson, Carrie. And Carrie looked at me as I'm walking down, and immediately the Holy Ghost must have quickened in him what I was battling. And he said, you old spirit of depression, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. And Carrie reached out like this to lay his hand on my head. I got about two feet from him. And his hands like this. He never touched me. He never got to me. All of a sudden, I just went poof. My feet give out. My body, I mean, the power of God hit me like a train. I'll tell you a little secret. I lay on that floor for a while, just enjoying the presence of the Lord. Just feeling God hugging on me and loving on me. That's what it feels like. And when I come up off that floor, Martin, that depression was gone like this. Instant. If you've ever experienced depression, you know depression don't leave instantly. It don't just, you know, all of a sudden pick up and go. But that fast, I was delivered from that because it was a spirit. It was a spirit trying to uh, not possess me, but trying to afflict me, you know, and trying to vex me. I said all that to say this. The representation in the baptism of the Holy Ghost of fire speaks to the grace of God. What should by its very nature destroy us instead saves us. God says that's my grace. That's my grace. Nobody should be able to stand before me. Nobody should ever. Honestly, there's not a person in this world who, if they had to earn salvation, could do it. It's impossible. If you had to earn it, even if you tried to live up to the mandates of the law of Moses, you cannot possibly do it. You can't. You just can't. God says, but that fire that should destroy instead comes to save. Hallelujah. Amen. He said, that's my grace. That's a demonstration to you of my grace. So when I baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire, that is the outpouring on you of my grace. The very fact that I'm able to share my nature, to share my presence and my power. The Word of God promises in Acts 1 and 8, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in Judea and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. The Holy Ghost baptism brought, brings power to the believer and to the church collectively. But listen, but it's the fire 
that creates the draw. Let me tell you something. You, you, want, you want to draw folks, build a fire. I've talked about this in the past when I talked about light, you know, and that sort of thing. You want to get people's attention? Carry a fire. Let somebody walk down the middle of Main Street holding a torch and see if they don't get all kinds of attention, right? What's that guy doing with that fire? He can walk down Main Street, he can be holding a sign, he can be holding uh, anything else, and people think, well, maybe they're a little crazy. But if he's holding a flame, people are going to be like, well, what, what's that? It's going to get their attention. God said, I fill you with the Holy Ghost and with fire because it's the fire that creates the draw. How did Moses know to meet God on top of Mount Sinai? Because there was a bush up there burning. He saw a flame. And he went up to investigate. Do you follow what I'm telling you? That's how God drew them. That's how God drew Moses to that, uh, to that bush was the flame. The flame was there to draw Moses, to get Moses' attention. God said, I put fire in your life so that you can draw men to me. Because after all, what's he put in us? His presence. He's put himself in us. He said, I'm not drawing them to you. I'm drawing them to me. Hallelujah, but I'm drawing them to me through you. People look at us Pentecostal folks, they think we're about half crazy, especially when we have one of them church services, you know, where people are shouting and dancing and running the aisles and, I mean, the fire. And, you know, we're just having a time. And we're having a time because of the fire. Because fire represents passion. Fire represents energy, right? You, you know, you ain't never seen a, a fire burn passively. <laughs> no, fire burns, it rages, it roars. Am I telling the truth? Amen. Well, Pentecostal worship, honey, our church right now, are, we're, our church is a little low-key worship, but we'll get where we're going, God willing, one day. And, uh, and you all may never worship any different than you do now, but God's going to put people around you that are going to shout a little, get happy, and you can sit there quiet as you want to. It's all right. Nobody hold it against you. But we're going to have some shouters and dancers if it kills me. <laughs> but people see that fire. I'm going to tell you something. My aunt, who's passed away now, my father's sister, my, my father's siblings did not grow up in church. My, my grandparents on my dad's side were very... Uh, I, I don't even know if to call them agnostic per se. I, I really don't know if they had any concept of God or not. All I know is they had no interest in church. So their 12 children grew up completely without any concept of church whatsoever. And my Aunt Susan told me one year at Thanksgiving, she said, you know, Chuck, my husband and I, he has a, a daughter from a previous marriage and uh, he said, when we were kids and your father and, mom and your mother met, said, your mom and grandma used to take some of us Moro children to church. Well, back then, they used to go to Brother Tatlock's church. That's another man you've heard me talk about. His was a little Jesus named One God Church up in, in uh, Wolcott, Connecticut, kind of country environment. I'm going to tell you, they used to tear a rug at Brother Tatlock's church. I mean, honey, them ladies would shout their hair down. They'd dance all over that church. They'd shout. They'd run the aisles. They'd jump the pews. They had church. I mean, they had some raucous church. And my Aunt Susan said, when I married my husband, I found out, you know, he has a daughter from previous marriage. He said, well, don't you know his daughter is Pentecostal? She goes to a United Pentecostal church in Waterbury, Connecticut. Well, that's the same church my great aunt and uncle went to. That they were also United Pentecostal. They went to the same church. And she said every Easter and every Christmas, she said, we go to church. Every Easter and every Christmas, we go to church. She said, and we go to that church. She said, I would not go to any other church than a Pentecostal church. She said, I will not go into a church if it didn't Pentecostal. Now, this is a woman who grew up completely without any knowledge of God, except when my mother and dad met, and she was probably about seven or eight at the time, you know. She said, I'm going to tell you something. She said, the way those Pentecostal people worship, she said, oh, my God, it's so real. 
they worship like they really believe this thing. They worship like they, they, they're not, you know, just sitting there listening. They, they worship like this is real to them. When they talk about the rapture, they start dancing and getting happy. When they talk about Jesus, they start dancing and getting happy. When they talk about the name of the Lord, they start dancing and getting happy. She said, my God, they act like they really, 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 really believe this thing. She said, I couldn't go to a church where they didn't worship like that. After going to that church when I was a kid and seeing, she said, man, you know what it was? It was the fire. Hallelujah, it was the fire. And the fire drew her. And now she don't want to be anywhere the fire ain't. She doesn't want to be anywhere where there isn't fire. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? One of the things I've worried, and, I, and, I, and, and, and please don't anybody take offense, but I'm just being transparent like this pulpit. One of the things I've worried about doing the work that I'm doing right now in the LGBT community and, and things being the way they are, and I've mentioned this to you, Martin, in private conversations, but I've said, Lord, don't let me lose my fire. Don't let me lose my fire. I don't ever want to lose my fire. Sometimes you get around folks that don't worship the way that I know to worship, you know, and it's easy to kind of just, it slips away. I've known a lot of preachers in my life who have lost their fire. I've seen them. I've watched them. And I said, Lord, it, you know, you've sent me like a missionary into a field of people. You know, when a missionary goes to Africa, when a missionary goes to New Guinea, those people don't know anything about Pentecostal worship either, you know. So, I mean, they're new to it, and it's new to them. And it may take that missionary decades before he's able to help them understand everything, you know. But in the meantime, he's got to keep his fire. I'm going to tell you, I still shout, honey. <laughs> I still dance. I still get happy. I may have to do it at home more than in church, but I still do it. Because I refuse to lose my fire. No, I refuse to give it up. I'm passionate about my faith. I believe this thing. Man, I'm telling you, when I start talking about the rapture, I believe the rapture's coming. When I start talking about the blood of Jesus, I believe the blood of Jesus saved my soul. When I start talking about the Holy Ghost, I believe the Holy Ghost brought power and victory into my life. Oh, it's real to me. And I mean, it's real enough to make me want to shout a little. It's real enough to make me want to dance a little. Amen. It's real enough to make me want to run the aisles a little. And I still do it because I pray, God, please don't. And this is one reason why every once in a while, if I have an opportunity, I like to dip into a church and a Pentecostal church that doesn't know me and they don't know anything about me. And I can kind of hide in there, you know, and let it rip. Just worship with them. Just worship God the way I know how to worship. Amen. I love that. And uh, But I want to tell you today, God has promised to baptize the church with Holy Ghost and with fire. And Jeremiah almost done today. Jeremiah 20 verse 9. But I say, Jeremiah said, I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name. So Jeremiah says, I'm going to shut up. I'm going to stop prophesying. I'm going to speak. I'm going to stop speaking for God because nobody's listening anyway. I kind of know how he feels. His word, Jeremiah said, is in my heart like a fire. A fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, even when I get so sick and tired, and I don't mean with y'all, because since y'all been here, things are different. I'm talking about there have been years when we've struggled to get a single soul into the building, okay? And I got so sick and tired of it, Martin, I wanted to quit S. Tommy. How many times I told him, I'm done, I'm, I'm through, I'm over, it's done. I quit, forget about it, I'm not doing this anymore. LGBT people couldn't give a flying fig whether or not there's a one God, Jesus name, Holy Ghost filled worshiping church that preaches the truth of God in Acts 2.38 and the Holy Ghost baptism in Jesus name. Baptism. There ain't nobody in this community gives a flying fig and I'm tired of trying and I mean, blah, 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 and I just poured it out, didn't I? Movie. How many times? Don't 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 tell us. <laughs> we know it's a lot. And what happened? 
what happened? Well, by Wednesday, I'm trudging into the church and I'm trying to do Bible study. Come Sunday, I get in the pulpit and I preach. And didn't I preach the way I always preach? Have I ever gotten up in this pulpit and preached any different than I always preach? No. I got up in that pulpit and I preached. You know why? Because it's like fire. It's like fire shut up in my bones. Even when I get weary, even when I get tired, even when I get frustrated, I grow weary trying to contain it. Hallelujah. And I have to let it out. I have to share the word of God in me, the truth of God in me, the message of the gospel that is in me. It is part of me by reason of the Holy Ghost. And I just can't keep it in. Just try to contain light. Try to contain heat. You can insulate that thing up one side, down the other, but one way or the other, heat's going to escape. Hello now. It's going to find an outlet. It's going to find a way out. Same thing with light. You can build a building. You know, if you want to see whether your building is locked tight and you've got it built just right, just go out at night, turn on a light on the inside, and look at it. I did it with my shed. Look at it. And you know what? If you see light... You know, uh-oh, I got a spot there where there, there's an area where bugs can come in. There's an area where heat can escape. There's an area where weather can get in. Am I telling the truth? Because you see light. Oh, I want to tell you today, children, God has promised to baptize us with the Holy Ghost and with fire. It's not destructive. It's not going to destroy you. It's not going to hurt you. It is a manifestation of His grace. People respond to passion. They respond to sincerity. They respond to energy and zeal. If you find a charismatic leader, you will find followers. While the Holy Ghost baptism empowers us, God also fills our vessel with a flame. A flame that burns and yet does not consume. Like the flame that drew Moses to the top of Mount Sinai, so the fire of God that comes with the Holy Ghost provides light, direction, illumination, heat, and it draws unbelievers to our faith and our walk with God. I'm going to close with this anecdote, and then I'm done. If you don't believe me, I'm going to, I'm going to fold my notes. Some of y'all, I can see into some of y'all's faces. So I, I thought he was done, I thought that was going to be his final statement. It was, but I got an anecdote. When I lived in Canton, Texas, I used to go to this little, you know, out in the country, they have convenience store, gas station, restaurants. It's all combined into one, you know, little thing. And we had one right there in, in downtown on Main Street, a little gas station convenience store, and they sold food, you know, and all. And they sold the most delicious hot dogs. I used to love their hot dogs. I like a good hot dog. Uh, if you go up north, we have hot dog stands and places all over the place. Down here, hot dogs aren't as popular, but up north, we love us a good hot dog. I like mine with mustard and sauerkraut, if you ask. Uh, that's that. I love me some good old-fashioned, you know. Mm. Well, I used to go to this convenience store. Well, I lived by myself, and I was living in this little rented trailer uh, motor mobile home, you know. And the convenience store was just down the street. So I'd go in there, and they had tables and all, and I'd sit at one of the tables, and I'd bring my Bible, and I'd read my Bible. I just wanted to be around people. I didn't want to be home sitting this long before the Internet, you know. And so I, I just wanted to be around people. And I'd go in there, and I'd sit. I don't know how many times... Somebody walked past me in the store, and a young lady one time was crying. And she was walking past me, and I kind of reached out, and I took her arm a little bit. I said, honey, what's wrong? She said, oh, I'm just having marital problems, you know. I said, well, do you want to talk about it? I said, I'm a minister. If you want to talk about it, said you can have a seat and we'll talk about it. She sat down and we start talking. I used to do this all the time. I just sat there giving people. God had sent people to me. And I'd wind up ministering to people. 
And I'm just sitting there reading my Bible and eating a hot dog or two, you know. One day, the girl that worked at the restaurant, the uh, convenience store restaurant, gas station, she would come over and she's talking to me and she said, you know something? She said, I grew up Southern Baptist. She said, I know all kind of people that call themselves Christians. She said, there is something about you that is so real. She said, I don't think I've ever seen anybody live their faith the way you do. She said, there's just something about you. She said, I can't even explain it. There's something about you that is different than any Christian person I know. She said, it's like there's a light just emanating from you. She said, people that are having trouble, people that are in distress, said they feel comfortable with you. The minute you start talking to them, they feel comfortable. And the minute you address them, it, they feel like they can confide in you and they can talk to you. And, you know, I was not pastoring at this time. I was a member of a church. I was a minister. I was an evangelist. I traveled and preached, but I was not pastoring, you know. And she said, but... But there's just, there's such a love and there's such an acceptance of people and you don't judge people and you're not criticizing people. She said, you know, there's just something so positive and so constructive in you that I don't see in most Christian people. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, everybody worship Brother Charles. Let's all come down to the altar and worship Brother Charles. We worship Jesus in this church. Trump is not up on the cross. Jesus is, okay? Neither is Pastor Charles, so that's not why I'm saying that, but what I'm saying is, it's the presence of the fire. It's having that passion. It's having, do you follow that zeal? Having that energy. That fire gives me boldness. Because let me tell you something, as a kid, Tommy can tell you, he met my first girlfriend up in Connecticut, my very first girlfriend. And she told him, said, my God, has he changed? She said, when we were kids, he was shy, he was quiet, he didn't hardly talk. She said, my God, has he changed, didn't she? <laughs> it's that fire. When God gave me the Holy Ghost, I'm telling you something. That Holy Ghost gave me zeal, it gave me energy, it gave me boldness. Hallelujah. He said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. But he's not only promised to fill us with the Holy Ghost, He's promised to fill us with the Holy Ghost and with fire. I told you I was done. If you stand with me this afternoon. <laughs> Amen.